In this episode, why do pros use really expensive mixer recorders like the Sound Devices Scorpio? Now, the Sound Devices Scorpio is a $9,000 mixer. It's relatively new from Sound Devices came out just or what was announced back at NAB in April of this year, 2019. It is not the most expensive mixer in this league, if you will. Uh, Zaxcom has their Diva 24, which runs about $12,000. And Aton has their Kantar X3, which runs, I believe, around 15, I think, somewhere around there. They're really expensive. So what I want to do is look at what are the features that these have that you aren't finding in the more consumer-oriented recorders. Well, the first thing I think that a lot of people assume is that, wow, these recorders must have preamplifiers and magical electronics that make them sound so much better. They are virtually self-noise free. They, not virtually, just 100% self-noise free. They're perfect in every way, and they must have really good build quality. And all of those things are mostly true. They do still have self-noise. Every electronic circuit that does amplification is going to have some self-noise, but they don't have a whole lot. But that's not the only thing. And they do sound really good, but that's also not the only thing. There are a lot of other features in here that are really important to professionals that may not be as important to those that are shooting passion projects that are completely self-funded. So the Scorpio is Sound Device's new flagship mixer recorder. It's a new platform or an ecosystem, if you'd like to think of it in those terms. And it's really anticipated to be around for the next decade or more. So what are the unique features of the Scorpio relative to previous generation recorders in the Sound Devices lineup? Number one, massive, massive amounts of inputs and outputs. So these are both physical and Dante-based inputs and outputs. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a bit. Basically, this is as functional as a digital mixing board that you would see at large installations in different venues, but it's small enough to fit into a sound bag and be used by a location sound mixer. Scorpio is also really a powerful new platform that allows new features that haven't even been dreamed up yet. It has three different FPGAs, we'll talk about what that means, and what we have now in this product is really only the beginning. This also paves the way for new mixers and recorders in the same lineup, so I'm hopeful that someday, and I don't have any sort of inside information, and I should pause here and say, I'm not being paid by sound devices to do this, I don't own the Scorpio. They're actually lending it to me. They've never given me any gear. They've never paid me to do any reviews. And in this case, they're just letting me borrow the gear so I can get my hands on it, experience it, and tell you about it. They haven't reviewed this. They're not checking my opinion before I share it with you, just to give you some background. When I talked to Paul Isaacs of Sound Devices at NAB in April, he said that really, this is an upgrade from the 688, which is from their mixer recorder line, and the 788, which is from their recorder line. So first of all, we talked about massive input and output. We're talking about a mixer recorder that is capable of recording 32 independent input channels. It records up to 36 individual tracks. It also supports 12 buses. And it has 16 inbuilt preamplifier and line inputs. So on the physical device itself, you can attach up to 16 different inputs. That's pretty astonishing for a mixer that can fit inside of a sound bag. And a sound bag is something that presumably a sound mixer or a solo location sound mixer boom operator could carry around all day long. Of course, it also has Sound Devices signature analog limiters and high pass filters. And these new preamplifiers are different from the previous generation products. It now supplies up to 76 dB of gain, and it is their quietest microphone preamplifier in terms of self noise ever. So at a really high level, who would use this? <laughs> who needs that many input channels? Well, I think there are some pretty obvious examples. Reality TV shows have gotten crazy. You can have a ton of different people that need to be mic'd up. And so that's one example. I think sometimes live shows tend to be very kind of channel hungry as well. I heard recently from my friend Michael Wynn, who is a TV and film production sound mixer. And he told a story of a production he worked on. It was a union production, and the director told him that anyone who was a SAG actor, that is a union actor, had to have a wireless microphone on them. And in that particular production, that was something like 15 people. So these particular scenarios are not unheard of. So there are definitely cases where you may need a very high channel count if you're working at that level of production. 
Now, of course, inputs and outputs are not the only new feature of the Scorpio. They also has an internal SSD drive with 256 gigabytes of storage, also supports recording to two SD cards simultaneously with the internal SD card. So you have some backups there. And on that internal SSD, you could record up to eight hours of 36 track, 96 kilohertz audio. So you've got a lot of storage there. Now, as far as outputs, you also have 12 physical outputs on the device itself. That is a lot of outputs. That includes full routing on each of those outputs. And there are multiple comm returns, three headphone outputs, 32 Dante outputs, and again, fully flexible routing on all of those. That means within the configuration on the mixer, you can tell exactly what you want it to send to each of those individual outputs. So you can do, kind of meet the requirements for really, really complex productions. You might ask, well, give an example of that. Well, for example, if you have comms, that's gonna be the audio team typically that you're gonna to need to be able to communicate back and forth. And so you can do that. In addition to that, you can also send wireless headphones to various production crew members. So the director, the script supervisor, and other members of the crew that might need one. You can get camera returns. You can output to other devices that may be doing maybe a backup recorder, so on and so forth. So you have a lot, a lot, a lot of flexibility. The Scorpio also, of course, supports both AES input and output. AES input and output is digital input and output. AES is the standard. And that allows you to take audio in that already encoded digital format and bring it into the Scorpio, or you can output in that digital format. You might ask, well, why would you ever wanna do that? One example I can think of that I have done myself in the past from my 633 is actually route an AES digital signal to a camera. That way, the camera had the highest quality audio possible. So they didn't need to do any syncing in post. They were able to take the high quality audio that I was recording right in my sound device's 633 mixer recorder, right straight into the camera, synced up. So in post, all they had to do was get to editing. No syncing required. Now, while you can use the Scorpio in a bag, I think that really a lot of the use cases are gonna involve reusing it on a sound cart instead. So these, again, are gonna be the much larger productions where there's actually a video village, which is where all of the kind of stuff near set, uh, perhaps where the director may sit, the script supervisor may sit, there'll be a separate sound cart where the mixer will sit and um, operate their Scorpio from a sound cart. Now, speaking of sound carts, when you're sitting at a sound cart as a mixer, typically you're gonna to wanna to have some sort of control interface with linear faders and things of that nature, which makes it just a little bit easier to control all this massive number of input channels. And so the interesting choice that Sound Devices made was supporting USB MIDI controllers. So there is one out of the gate made by a company called Icon that they support, and they'll be adding support for additional control surfaces in the future. I thought this was an interesting approach because in the past they had their own proprietary uh, control surfaces, but with the new USB MIDI control protocol, they can actually get less latency and better response from the controllers into the recorder itself. So this is a really interesting move. Also, these third-party controllers, a lot less expensive. So for example, the controller that went with the Sound Devices 688 mixer ran about $2,000 US. But for example, the Icon control surface runs somewhere, I think, between three and $500. So it's significantly less expensive. It has motorized faders, which the $2,000 Sound Devices controller didn't have. So they're really kind of, in some respects, opening up the platform to give the location sound mixers and the production sound mixers a choice in the type of controller they wanna use. Really nice step. They've also added a three band parametric equalizer to each of those inputs. So if you need to somehow solve a problem or perhaps tune the sound a little bit for whatever reason, maybe for a live show, where you're also sending a feed to a PA system, you can now do that. Now, because this mixer has so many inputs and so many outputs, they designed a new control app for tablets that allows you to control the mixer and to see all the meters on a much larger format. So that's an option as well. Currently, there's an Android version of the app and they're working on an iOS version of the app. So I think we're gonna see some interesting things there. This allows you to do a whole bunch of different things, including metering, soloing, arming and disarming tracks, muting, metadata entry. So if you need to enter notes and name channels and things of that nature, transport controls, it can also connect via USB or it can connect via Bluetooth. So you have some options there as well. Now, sometimes when you get on set, you wanna kind of reduce the amount of RF traffic there is <laughs> because there's so much else going on. 
So it's nice that you can also USB connect this if you choose to do that. One of the things that makes the Scorpio so interesting is that internally it has three different FPGAs. An FPGA is a field programmable gate array, fancy name for basically what is a firmware updatable processor. And these are super powerful. This means that they can add new features using those three FPGAs that are built into the Scorpio at any time in the future just by giving you a firmware update. And my experience with sound devices is they're pretty good about giving new firmware updates. In fact, with my 633 mixer recorder, I was really delighted. I've had it now for about four and a half years, I think, maybe five years. And at one point, after I'd owned it for at least a year, there was a firmware update that added auto mix capability. So that was very, very cool. Now, of course, they'll be adding things like that to the Scorpio as well. It's anticipated. So really, really cool things it can do. Now, what's the trade-off with using an FPGA? I think it's important to talk about this. An FPGA has the benefit of being able to change based on its firmware. So you can essentially reprogram it to do new functions. The cost of an FPGA is that it is a little bit slower than an ASIC, and we'll talk about what an ASIC is in just a second here, and it generates more heat. It's a little bit more power hungry as well. So the thing about implementing a device with FPGAs in it is you have to be very careful about power management. You don't want to suck through batteries too quickly. So to give an example, one of the things that I really like using as a solo shooter is Atomos makes several recorders, actually sound devices or video devices make some of these recorders as well. In the case of Atomos though, they use FPGAs to control them. And those things suck through batteries. They have ridiculously loud fans in them. Um, so while they have all these really cool features and they add new features all the time, the problem is, is that they haven't done a very good job at power management. And so they're kind of annoying to use in some ways, along with all the cool features they have. That was one thing that concerned me when I first heard about that in the Scorpio. However, what Sound Devices has done is very, very interesting, where they have a very aggressive power management set of features built into the Scorpio. So if you're not using something, it shuts it off. If you're not needing those FPGAs, it shuts them off. And so you're not burning through that power when you don't need it. If you're not using Dante, shuts it down. It has a little door on the back that you lift up when you need to plug in the ethernet cables for the Dante network. If you're not using that, if that door is shut, it just shuts down the entire Dante module. So really, really good job they've done here in terms of managing power and making sure that those FPGAs don't make it a bad experience by burning through batteries. Now we talked a second ago about ASICs. What are ASICs? ASICs are application specific integrated circuits. So these are basically like more traditional processors. They're hard coded. Once they've been manufactured, they, they can only do what they've been manufactured to do. So in the Scorpio, there are six ASICs. So they've kind of hard coded in the really critical functionality and then they have those three additional FPGAs to add new functions if they need to. So really kind of an interesting balance of design there, which I'm really pleased to see. So that means those ASICs are gonna be a lot more power efficient. They're not gonna generate as much heat. They're not gonna burn through your batteries as quickly. So a really interesting approach they took here. The Scorpio also has USB-A and USB-C outputs and inputs on the side. USB-A works with hubs, so you can actually connect multiple accessories. So for example, this is where you would connect a control surface if you wanted to add that to your setup. But with that hub, you can actually add additional accessories as well. So for example, you could also connect the app if you wanted to connect that via USB at the same time. That's a unique new feature. If I consider looking back at all the other mixers and recorders I've used that have USB ports, that was not supported. And then USB-C is there to do file transfer from the Scorpio to your computer. The Dugan Auto Mix feature will support up to 16 simultaneous ch uh, channels. So that'll be coming here in the near future on a firmware update. What that does basically is that as you're recording 16 people, up to 16 people, I should say, it will actually automatically adjust the faders. So if somebody's not talking, it will actually fade their channel back, their microphone back, so it's not adding noise to the overall recording. And Dugan Auto Mixing is probably the best in the industry that I've ever used. It's very good at managing all of those microphones. It's never I've never caught it not opening a microphone quickly enough, um, and it does a very good job of pulling those uh, faders down for the microphones that aren't currently being spoken into. So that eliminates the potential for bleed from one microphone to another. So if somebody's talking into their microphone, it prevents it from bleeding into another microphone. And it also helps cut down on the overall noise. So you get a cleaner overall mix. Now, Dante. What is Dante? Dante is essentially 
audio networking. That is to say, you can put a Dante stage breakout box somewhere else closer to set. It can have, say, for example, 32 inputs. You connect that box via an Ethernet cable, a single Ethernet cable, to the Scorpio, and now you can use all 32 channels on that remote box into your Scorpio over a single Ethernet network cable. That's pretty awesome. Now, if any of you have done live sound before, you know about the snake that you generally have to run from the mixing board up to the stage um, to get your microphone inputs and then to send the audio back up to the power amps and to the PA speakers. That, those things are a pain. They're, they're super thick cables. They, uh, you have to route them through, you know, through the audience generally. Then you got to tape everything down. Now, you still have to do that with an Ethernet cable, but it's a lot easier to manage a single Ethernet cable than one of those massive snakes. So it's a really, really nice step forward. Now, not only can you get inputs via Dante, you can also send audio to Dante outputs. So, And you have ultimate routing capability with Dante Networks. You can get an input from anywhere on the network and send an output to anywhere on the network. So Dante is really interesting for those high input and output demanding jobs that you may run into. In terms of powering the Scorpio, there are a variety of different options. Gone are the days of AA batteries. So now you have two Sony NPF style battery sleds on the back, sometimes called Sony L-mount batteries. So you can mount those on the back and they will sit flush so they don't actually stick out from the back of the mixer, which is really nice. And then you also have two TA4 inputs so you can connect smart batteries and battery distribution systems. So for example, if we wanted to use these inspired energy uh, type batteries, these smart batteries, you can connect those to both of the different external inputs. There's one on the bottom and one on the side. So again, you have options there. It's very flexible, so however it fits best in your bag, you can get it working that way. Over the years, Sound Device has also developed a slot-in wireless receiver system, so you can actually put slot receivers into the same bag with your recorder. It was originally made for the 688 mixer recorder, but now that also works with the Scorpio as well. So all of that existing hardware out there for the mixers that already use that, compatible with the Scorpio as well. So you can get six channels of wireless with one of those little racks that you fit in your sound bag, and it'll take dual channel receivers. There are also three COM circuits. So there are two private circuits plus a public slate circuit. You can configure whether you duck, mute, or do nothing when sending COM traffic out. So again, these comms are something that are very common on the bigger production sets where you need to be able to communicate. And so this has all of the support for that built in, which is really nice as well. Supports the new auto mute feature. That is to say, when you're not recording, it won't send output to the outputs that you don't want it to send it to. So for example, if you've got something going to the script supervisor, you don't necessarily want everything between every take going to the script supervisor as well. That could drive them crazy. Um, so you can set up auto mute so it only plays back to them when you're actually rolling. Scorpio supports both pre-roll and post-roll up to 10 seconds before and 10 seconds after. And if within that 10 seconds after you've stopped a recording, you just decide, oh, we need to keep rolling, and you press record again, it will actually continue that same recording. It won't start a new one, continue the same one that you are already going on, which is a very cool feature. So basically eliminating a lot of the potential mistakes that can happen on set because things get crazy. Uh, sometimes if you get a late start, that pre-roll will save you there. If you thought things were gonna cut, but they end up letting it go and keep going, then you can actually continue the recording, even if you've already pressed stop, if you do it within that 10 second period. Another feature that hasn't been supported on most recorders and mixers that I've used in the past, in fact, I can't think of one that does, is you can actually arm a track mid take. So while you're actually rolling and recording, you can now actually arm a track right in the middle of that recording, and it will add that microphone from that point on within the recording. Scorpio also supports both broadcast wave format, which has kind of been the standard format for many years, and also R64, which is a 64-bit format. So now we can record longer than four gigabyte files. Hallelujah. <laughs> they also support the XFAT file system, which also is what's necessary to enable those longer than four gigabyte files. So between those two things, you can actually go well beyond the four gigabyte limit and record really long takes as a single audio file. So that makes posts a lot easier for those long takes. And as it turns out, a lot of different digital audio workstations already support R64. Of course, you have the very high quality time code generator and word clock built into the Scorpio, and you have the ability to route where the recordings go to on the SSD or the two SD cards, exactly what goes to each one of them. So you have a lot of flexibility there as well. 
Lots of custom shortcuts using physical controls on the device itself so you don't have to do a lot of menu diving. If there's a common function that you need to access, you can actually set that up and assign which combination of controls will get you to that very quickly. Makes operating this on long production days and particular circumstances a lot easier and a lot more powerful. From my point of view, a very well thought out ergonomic layout of the input and output ports, menu system and channel controls, both the trim and the fader, and all of the different toggle switches. This is something that I think Sound Devices has done really well for a long time. And we see that carried forward here into the Scorpio, where again, from a physical ergonomics point of view, and in the menu system as well, they really thought things out well. So once you've spent the time to learn how their particular system works, and it doesn't take that long, it's pretty easy to get things done that you need to get done. Of course, the build quality is extraordinarily high. And there's also the very high quality RF shielding that you would expect from a sound device's mixer and recorder. So these things are rock solid. A tank could drive over one of these and you'd still be okay. RF shielding, I have never had an RF issue with my sound device's 633. And I'm told that the Scorpio carries over that same high quality RF shielding. In fact, they put an antenna connector for the Bluetooth radio. So if you are gonna connect your app via Bluetooth, there is a port where you can connect an antenna. That's how well RF shielded this device is. So this is still early days for Scorpio. It looks like a very interesting platform. I'm very happy that I got a chance to try it out. Now, the big question I think people ask, Curtis, are you gonna buy one? Well, not at the moment. I'm not doing the type of production that requires that level of input and output. I'm very happy with my 633. I will say that I will be very tempted and probably will buy uh, a miniature version of the Scorpio at some point in the future, assuming that comes out. Pretty sure it will because it was the 688 that came out from Sound Devices and then later the 633 came out, which was a smaller version of it. So in any case, I think it's a great recorder for the pros working at the highest level of production in terms of input and output counts and the demands that they face when they're sitting at their cart and all of the different things that the production is expecting of them. They have a really hard job and the Scorpio makes it a lot easier. So hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. And if you have not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video.